I'm Paulina Lee, and this is Here at Haas, a student-run podcast connecting you to Haasies and the faculty that change our lives. This week on Here at Haas, we are joined by Professor Ross Levine, the Willis H. Booth Chair in Banking and Finance at Haas. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Thanks for coming on the show today. Great to be here. How's your Sunday going? Oh, it's a wonderful Sunday. Went for a long hike early in the morning because it's kind of hot. And uh, then actually been doing some research the rest of the day. Ooh, great. Well, we'll have to ask about that research a little bit later. For starters, you did your undergrad at Cornell and your PhD at UCLA, but would love for you to share your background and your different jobs and roles you've had before coming to Haas. Oh, I had many jobs. So (laughs) after graduate school, I met my wife in graduate school, and she went on the job market the year before that I did, and she got her dream job at the International Monetary Fund in Washington. And so I followed her there and was able to finish my dissertation while working as an intern at the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank. And I was very fortunate. They offered me a permanent job. So as you know, with dual careers, it was nice to end up about two blocks away from each other and we could both walk to work. And I started out doing research on international finance exchange rates and decided I didn't like that very much, didn't want to do research anymore. My wife was at the International Monetary Fund and her work going to countries and dealing with a variety of policy issues was so much more interesting than my work. And so in the evenings, I learned Spanish, which was sort of a prerequisite for getting into the World Bank. I couldn't go to the IMF because she was working there. My wife is from Chile, so she could help me on the Spanish front. And then I moved to the World Bank, which was really the defining time in my intellectual development. Now it's a catchphrase to talk about diversity. But boy, the World Bank is diverse. People from all over the world, all different religions and different professional backgrounds. I would go on work with lawyers and bank regulators, and I was an economist, and it was just fantastic. And then I think I just didn't want a boss anymore. I just wanted to pursue my agenda, and I was fortunate because at the World Bank, even though I had left the Fed in order to stop research, when I got to the World Bank, I fell into doing some work that was completely different from my dissertation and really started a research agenda. And then I figured, okay, I'll just write one paper and then I'll go back to doing the core work of the bank. And then just like one more paper and then one more paper, then one more paper. Then when I left for academia, it's like, okay, I just have to finish this research agenda with no bosses and then I'll come back to the World Bank. And that hasn't happened yet. (laughs) So um, then in academia, did a little moving around and ended up at the fantastic place uh, that we know and love, Haas. That's great. And taking a step back, I often wonder how people end up in their careers. And I think it's part of my own curiosity of trying to figure out what I want to do. But did you have an aha moment when you're like, this is it, I am going to become an economist? Or how did you start down that path? It was a little bit more of an evolution. So in high school, the only thing I wanted to do was play basketball. And it kind of dawned on me at some point that, I, that this really wasn't going to be a very successful professional endeavor. <laughs> and then I decided I wanted to be a columnist for the New York Times, but I don't write very well. And so then I figured I better learn about how the world works and then I could write for a broader audience. That was really the motivation. I was good at math and good at computers. And so there was a natural link with economics. And then in economics, I, I was just struck by disparities between the rich and the poor in countries around the world. I grew up in a very poor neighborhood, very kind of violent, and other people grew up in different neighborhoods. So there were such dramatic differences, both in opportunities and outcomes. That was fascinating to me. And like I said, went to graduate school and what happens in graduate school is you're, you, you, everything becomes focused on writing a paper, writing a dissertation. Mm-hmm. And 
if I would have gone to academia right after graduate school, I wouldn't be a researcher now because I didn't have an agenda that I loved. It was only after going to the Fed where I could do work very different from my dissertation, learn that I like policy work, then go to the World Bank and find an agenda that was exciting to me and that I wanted to pursue. And when I was deciding to go to academia, if you want an aha moment, I told my father, I'm going to go to academia. I have a good enough publication record. And he asked me, he says, but what are you going to do? <laughs> he says, the question being that, what does academia give you? You know, besides wonderful students, what academia gives you is freedom. So he's like, okay, what, what are you going to do? And it took about a year for me to really be able to write down in a few sentences what I wanted to do. And, and that's why I ultimately made the move there. May I ask what those sentences were? Yeah, I wanted to figure out the role of the financial sector in addressing the questions that I mentioned about why are some countries successful, others less successful? Why are some people have more opportunities and others less? And so for about two decades, I kept digging at questions surrounding the, the theme that evolved over time, which was that hey, the financial sector decides who can start a business and who can't start a business. And the financial sector decides who can expand and who can't. And the financial sector decides whether you can purchase a home and live someplace that's conducive to the cognitive and non-cognitive development of your, your children. And even if you never deal with the financial sector at all, the financial sector determines whether you're looking for work in a competitive environment because Part of the ways in which firms compete is by raising capital mm -hmm. in order to do something. And so as I started to work on this and discover more and more, it came an agenda about how finance really shapes the contours of individuals and communities and countries' economic horizons. And that really became sort of the... the defining theme for, like I say, a couple of, a few decades or so. And that, that's been fun, really fun and very rewarding, very rewarding. When you think about working at the World Bank, you said you were learning Spanish. Is that a requirement of the job bilingual? Oh, it's because it, it, it's as the World Bank, it's, it's an international organization and many people come from around the world. They, they have their home country language, and so the, most people around the world learn English. So yeah. almost everybody comes as bilingual. But for somebody from the U.S., it's, it's very important to not just be U.S.-centric. And uh, so it's, I don't know if it's a requirement, but it's close to a requirement to be bilingual. An unspoken requirement, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what was it like working at the World Bank? What do you think was your biggest challenge that you faced? And what was the biggest thing that you learned? I, I love the World Bank. If there's, if there's something big like that. There's always bureaucratic issues. But the most wonderful thing about the World Bank was just debating all sorts of issues with all sorts of people. And that was just wonderful. And it wasn't just differences in nationalities, which is fun. It was also differences in professional approaches. So given my area of finance, I would often go on trips to countries where there'd be a lawyer and there'd be a regulator and there would be business people because we'd be talking to uh, the banks. And it was learning how to communicate with all of these people with different expertise in a way such that we could come together and produce something useful for, for the country, at least try to do that. And that was just wonderful. I love that collaboration and challenge of learning to interact with other people. There, there are always barriers. For example, the regulators always think, that the economists are just floating around in outer space with their <laughs> theories and they can't really do anything useful. Mm -hmm. And the economists tend to think of the regulators, you just have this rule book that's given to you with no thought that goes into it. This is a political outcome. 
And so how could you, given that you just know this rule book, design a new rule book? That's not what you were trained for. But by talking and appreciating what different people bring to the table, something I'm sure that is a part of your work environment and, and training at Haas, but something that I lived through all of the time at the World Bank, that was fantastic. It was just really the defining years of my professional career. And then, yeah, just great. That's almost awesome. And when you moved over to academia, what was the biggest shock for you? It's a good question. I think the biggest shock is how strong the relationship is between a faculty member and a PhD student. Hmm. Because this PhD student is there for five years and grows up in many different ways and different students grow up in different ways. And there's a profound responsibility to the students. And it's difficult to discern when to tell someone that perhaps this isn't the right avenue for them. Mm -hmm. And it's just not clear. How am I supposed to know? We all struggle in, in the beginning. But at the same time, you don't want to encourage somebody who's certainly very bright and capable with lots of opportunities to spend years on something where if you don't think that this is going to be fruitful for them. And then once they jump in, there's a lot of responsibility in guiding their work and figuring out how to guide their work. And how much do you intervene? How much do you let them make mistakes? It's akin a little bit to being a parent and then still am figuring out how to navigate the intensity of that relationship. Because teaching undergrads mm -hmm. and teaching MBA students, typically the, it's not a one-on-one -on -one intense relationship for many years where you have a major impact mm -hmm. on how they enter their professional lives. So I think that was the hardest for me. In fact, there's a woman in Hong Kong now who I met when I was on a trip. And we started working together about six years ago. And she's coming up for tenure. And she has just done remarkably well. And to mm -hmm. see her grow over this time period has just been a, a great joy. And, and so it, it's both very satisfying, but it's, 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 yeah. you feel this, this intense responsibility. That's a great point. My dad did his PhD as well. And I know when he's been mentoring other students, his number one thing is you have to find a really good professor or sponsor to work under because yeah. it'll make or break your work, what you work on, everything that you do. So it's, it's a good analogy because I think people probably on the outside looking in think it must be just like any boss, manager, worker, but it's actually much more intense and much more intimate than that. Yeah. One of my favorite parts about class this, this past year was when we had time at the end of the class and oh, you gave research. the opportunity. Yeah, for research. I loved how you always would give us two or three options and the whole class would vote. <laughs> so would love for you to talk a little bit about your research and kind of where the bulk of it has been and what you're working on today. So first on the class, as I mentioned to you, but not, not on your podcast, it, it was just... A phenomenal class. The people were so engaged, so energetic. And by the way, because the class was so into everything, it made it easy and exciting for me to try to be the best version of myself and to give as much as I could to the class. And so the energy really is in infectious. And just so the listeners know, I mean, you guys are coming from a work week. You're there on Saturday. There's eight hours of class with a short hour break for lunch, which is not really an hour because you're standing in line and things like that for some food. And so when it gets to be hour seven 
and people are totally engaged, asking questions, wanting for more and things like that, it says an unbelievable amount about the quality and the enthusiasm of the people in that room. So I just, I miss everybody from the class. It's, it's just a fantastic group, just a fantastic group. Okay, research. So I think the, 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 the big, big, big research picture was what I mentioned, that mm-hmm. it's really been about showing that finance exerts a first order impact on the economic growth of countries, on income inequality uh, within countries, and poverty levels. And I think maybe interesting is that for poverty, it's not about that a better financial system makes it easier for a a poor person to get a loan to open up his or her business. It's much more about that with a well-functioning financial system, firms compete with each other to get funds and they can get funds and then they go out and seek out the best workers in order to compete. And that's what helps people at the lower end of the income distribution more than their ability to get money. Actually, I just finished something on COVID, which is a little bit different. Mm, So I was quite curious about which firms were more immune to the pandemic than other firms. Mm. And part of it was maybe this would be useful for investors because going forward, since there's likely to be other global events, they may be able to isolate which corporate characteristics make them more or less resistant to shocks. So we looked at a, at a variety of characteristics. We had information on about 8,000 firms across the world, so we, we, we could dig into many details. So I thought I would tell you about one because it's something I was skeptical about. So maybe you've heard about corporate social responsibility. Yep. I work for a large corporation called Procter & Gamble. Fantastic. (laughs) Okay. So I was very, very skeptical and have been very, very skeptical about how important corporate social responsibility is for the actual functioning of firms. Mm-hmm. as opposed to a mechanism for doing some publicity but not actually having an impact. And I was proven wrong, or at least my research proved me wrong. <laughs> and so <clears throat> one argument is that part of what goes on in a firm is that workers come together and there's a community in which the firm operates, there are suppliers to the firm, and of course there are formal contracts. But there are lots of arrangements that have to take place between all of these stakeholders that are more informal in nature. And so that's where trust can be an important input because it's difficult to write a contract for every sort of behavior and contingency. So some people have argued that if you're a firm and you engage in responsible actions and you treat people fairly and well, Then when there's a shock, Mm -hmm. those stakeholders, those workers, those suppliers will be willing to work with you to overcome the shock more effectively than if they don't trust you. And there's a sense of, okay, there's a shock. We're going to have to give a little bit for this firm. This firm has always done right by us in the past. When things turn around, hopefully they do turn around, then the firm is going to do right by us in the future. And we just can't write a, a, a contract contingent on all the possible outcomes. So they, people would argue for that. I didn't believe it. <laughs> but it holds up very, very strongly that controlling for many features about firms, and that's the wonderful thing about having so much data, firms that had engaged in more corporate social responsibility in the past were more resilient to the, to the shock in the sense that their stock prices took much less of a hit than otherwise similar firms, even within the same country, within the same industry. So that's sort of one finding that surprised me and you know, maybe you find stimulating too. <laughs> For sure. I mean, as someone working in a large corporation, as an employee, we got to see a lot of the things that the company committed 
to local communities, to the employees themselves, providing PPE, and the way that they handled the whole situation. And they have a pretty large platform of corporate um, responsibility that they stand on to. And I'm curious, how does research typically start? Does it start from you? You have an idea, you have a budget, you go and run with it. Do you have to get any approvals or what does that really look like? So this is different from economics from most of the physical sciences, although there's some differences within economics. But for for my work, it's I have an idea much of the time. My co-authors have an idea and they bring me in and we discuss it and we refine it and then we go forward. And the main expense oftentimes is purchasing data, but that's much, much less expensive than what chemists, biologists, right. and people doing environmental sciences have to do. It's just an order of magnitude different. There's some people um, who do experiments with people, and that's more expensive in, 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 at the business school and in the economics department, but I, I haven't done that. Got so it. for me, that's why for me, given the, the shock of the pandemic, as horrible mm-hmm. as it is for everyone it doesn't affect my research very much because most of my co-authors are somewhere around the world, mm-hmm. Hong Kong, Frankfurt, Israel, London. So it doesn't matter very much. Work has gone along pretty well. That makes sense because for the most part, you're using existing databases, right? Exactly. From different surveys that are out there. And even when we construct data, it's very different from the physical sciences, even when it's constructing data, it's going to different types of websites and putting together new data. It, it, but mm-hmm. it's not putting people through questionnaires or things like that. Got it. I know you've done a lot of research and you shared a lot of these in our class time as well, but do you have one or three of your papers that you would say were the most surprising in terms of results or that you got the most out of? So... It's a loaded question. I know you have a lot of papers but <laughs> that you're well, the, the problem is I can't remember. That's <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of papers and I'm old. You combine those two things, it's a problem. I, so I think that the, there's... I'll, I'll go to three. So the first one, I couldn't believe. As I mentioned to you, One of the big things that I started doing research on was the links between finance and how countries perform in the long run over one, two, three decades. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did there was, and it was different at the time, was to really put together lots of good data on, on the functioning of banking systems around the world. Found very strong results. So you look at Banking systems at the beginning, in 1960, you could predict growth over the next three and then four decades. So this is just, it was like amazing when I found this. And you looked at other things that everybody talked about. Everybody talks about international trade. No, it doesn't predict it. Everybody talks about political uncertainty and revolutions and coups. No, it doesn't predict growth over the next few decades. And then you look at, oh, it's the macro economy. And it's inflation and deficit. No, but it doesn't predict growth. (laughs) It was like only finance predicts growth. Hmm. And then I said, well, why are we only focusing on banks? What happens if we look at stock markets? And the intuition was that oftentimes what banks do is they form a relationship with a firm. Hmm. And by forming a relationship with the firm, they get lots of information about the firm. And so if you have better functioning banks... Part of what that phrase means, better functioning, is that they may be better at picking out the best firms. And if in a country banks are better at picking out the best firms and in another country banks are not so good at picking out the best firms, maybe they just lend money to their political friends, their cronies, the politicians. In one country, you're going to get better allocation of capital and faster growth and the other slower. So for stock markets, I said, maybe stock markets do something else. Maybe stock markets allow you to diversify risk. And so you could think of many situations. For example, let's say you're going to build a railroad and you know it's going to be profitable, but it's not going to be profitable for 10 years. So people may be reluctant to invest in the railroad because you put your money in and it's going to pay off big in 10 years, 
But let's say in two years you need money to go to graduate school. In two years you need money, somebody doesn't is, getting, is sick in your family. Two years you need money, your kids need to go to college or whatever mm-hmm. it is. So there's this issue of liquidity risk, and that may keep people from investing. It's like, well, if you have a stock market, you just sell your share to somebody else. And so that reduces the reluctance to invest, as well as the ability to hold a diversified portfolio. So I was like, mm-hmm. maybe they both affect growth. Uh, again, you're looking across like 90 countries over right. 40. It's just, so I kind of said, okay, so I'm going to include both of, these, both of these at the same time. And they both enter significantly. They both mm-hmm. predict growth, both banks and stock okay. markets. That shocked me. Mm-hmm. That, one, that one shocked me. So the other thing that shocked me was I, 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 I grew up in a, a very different neighborhood from most people in that and my neighborhood, neighborhood was that. So it was in Plainfield, New Jersey, okay. and it was ravaged by race riots in the late mm. 60s. And many white people sort of fled. And especially they fled the public schools. And the public schools were about 90% African American. And my parents very much believed in integration in public schools, and so I went to the public school. And so you had a very interesting mix because the relatively well to do black families also took their kids out of public schools. Mm. And so it was a very distinct group. And I became very aware of disparities in the U.S., not by reading it in a book, but by living it. Mm. And I always wanted to come back to studying race and didn't have a particular and unique strategy for saying something valuable. Many people study race and had great insights and things to say. And just because I wanted to do something, didn't mean I had anything valuable to add. But I kept thinking, how can finance give me an avenue in? And it was very interesting because I was at Brown University and there was a faculty member there guy named Yona Rubinstein, who's a genius, I think among the smartest people I've ever met. And he would go to the the seminars. No matter what seminar he went to, he always had something insightful to say. So I decided to take a class of his, his PhD class. He was an assistant professor. I was a a senior faculty member, but the guy who was brilliant, so I took his class. And he talked about uh, Gary Becker's theory of racial discrimination. And Gary Becker argued that one, not the only, but one manifestation of racial prejudices could be that a a white owner might, because of his or her racial biases, may be reluctant to hire black workers. Mm -hmm. And that if this happened at a big enough scale, these white owners might be willing to forego profits and they might be willing to hire a less capable white person in order to satisfy their desire to have white workers. And this is called taste-based discrimination because it's very much the purest form of racial discrimination. There are other types as well. And this theory requires that the owner be willing to accept less profits in order to get what the owner wants, which is a white workforce. Mm -hmm. And so in sitting in Yona's class, I said, man, I wonder if finance can say something because I knew what had happened in the U.S., that there had been some very peculiar changes across the individual states of the U.S., There were changes in banking regulations that, one, intensified competition among banks. And by intensifying the competition among banks, it intensified competition among firms. So the link there was that 
let's say you always lend to me. And, and even though there's another firm out there that's probably better than I am, you and I go golfing together, we go hiking together, so you just lend to me. Mm-hmm. Okay, but now all of a sudden, let's say another bank is going to come and compete with you. That other bank is going to lend to the other firm that's better, put me out of business, and put you out of business or hurt you. Mm-hmm. And so you respond to competition by looking for the best firm, mm-hmm. not just your golf buddy. Right. And this intensifies competition, not just in banking, it intensifies competition among all firms. And that's sort of the link back to Gary Becker and racial discrimination. Because now, this shock to banking, which is occurring for reasons that have nothing to do with racial discrimination, it's going to intensify competition among firms. So now if we go back to our story, if before, if I am a racist and I was willing to pay more for a less competent white person, I can't do that anymore because I have no profits to spare. So it's not that my racial attitudes change. It's just that I, in order to stay in business, I have to hire the best people, not the whitest people. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, we'll try this out. And, and, and it shows up very, very strongly that with this change in competition, you do see a reduction in the gap in wages between black workers and white workers with the same education and experience and things like that. So this was, this was also something that surprised me that I, I learned from and that had an impact. And it's a positive one, too. I remember you sharing that one in class and it was reassuring that competition actually does help in that sense yeah by the way if we wanted to talk about the positive things about competition the the paper that i'm working on today Mm -hmm. before we have had this opportunity to talk is also about corporate social responsibility and so there are different views about why firms take their money and invest in corporate social responsibility. And so one view is that executives are reluctant to invest in corporate social responsibility because this may give up some of the bonuses that they want to receive. And that owners of firms, shareholders, would like to invest more in corporate social responsibility because that's going to establish this trust that's going to help the firm in the long run where the executives focus on the short run. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to figure this out because there are many moving pieces. And so what we decided to do is we have information on shocks to competition. So then we can ask the question, when there's a shock to the competitive environment facing a firm, do they increase or decrease corporate social responsibility? So one argument, and this was sort of a little bit implicit in your your question, was that, hey, maybe competition forces people to focus on the short run, Mm. and they don't do that. They don't Mm -hmm. kind of invest in corporate social responsibility. The other view is that, actually, with competition, you can't mess around. You, You have to be focused on the long run, and you have to sort of get rid of executives that are focused too much on the short run. And the competition forces better governance of the firm. And one of the responses of better governance is to increase uh, expenditures on CSR. And that's what we find. Okay. Yeah, well, so that was kind of fun too. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll take, I'll make that my third, my third. That'll my, be your my third? third. Okay. That's my third one. <laughs> okay. But I'm curious because you mentioned earlier kind of the crux of your research looks at finance and the implications on countries over decades. So are there certain things that you're keeping an eye on or certain indicators that you're watching right now as countries combat COVID and combat the economic crisis and the different changes in the economy so that in 10 years from now, five years from now, whatever the timeline is, you can write a really good paper on it? Wow, that's a very good question. So I think I'm going to go very broad Mm -hmm. on this 
but I'm not sure how I can get it to be a paper. <laughs> the overarching tension in public policy has to do with the role of government. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, a spectrum. And so on the one hand, or over on one side, typically viewed as the left side, there's a belief that the government should play a major role in solving many problems. On a more right side of the spectrum, and right and left doesn't work very well in the U.S. right now, there's typically a view that you want limited government on limited questions, and the role of government should be focused on facilitating private sector solutions to problems. And this is just the classic problem in debate that's existed for a very long time. And this is going to be maybe super nerdy, but what's been interesting to me is, is I've been comparing a little bit in my spare time Adam Smith and James Madison. Mm -hmm. And they wrote about the same time, the Wealth of Nations of 1776, which is also a pretty big date for the U.S. <laughs> yep. And what Madison argues in the Federalist Papers is that the great challenge of government is how do you empower this government to solve problems while at the same time obliging it to control itself so that it doesn't do lots of pernicious things. And the same themes come up in The Wealth of Nations, where the, the invisible hand is obviously the most popular catchphrase, but, he talk, but, but Smith is for compulsory public education, is very much aware of the need for infrastructure, and very importantly, is very aware that industry is likely to capture government in order to restrict markets, whether it's restrict trade or create monopolies that protect a few. And this tends to be the biggest criticism of the government involvement. It's like, why would you ever trust the government? <laughs> Mm -hmm. For example, uh, for people now on the left in the U.S. who want more and more government involvement, I sometimes ask them the question, have you looked and see who's in charge of the government? Mm -hmm. and, like, and, and why do you want more of this empowerment of the government? Mm -hmm. Like You're so sure that, that a different set of people are going to be able to behave in a better way. And so this is this classic tension. Right. And... I think what we're clearly seeing with the pandemic is a move toward more government involvement. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not, but it's a change that's likely to have far-reaching implications besides laws having to do with sheltering in place and wearing a mask. And in my work on finance, this has potentially very dangerous implications. There's something in economics called moral hazard, which is a, a poor name, but it is the, the title of it. And the core intuition is that if I have some money and I get the upside and I'm insured against the downside loss, I'm going to take on big risks. Mm -hmm. And so if the government stands ready to bail me out, if I'm a bank or, or any other financial institution, if I fail, I'm more likely to take on big risks Right. which also increases the vulnerability of the economy. And my concern now is that by creating an explicit or implicit safety net for all types of institutions in the U.S. and around the world, what we are doing is creating incentives for excessive risk-taking. Mm -hmm. And there are debates about this. I think that the global financial crisis was largely or partially a reflection of that force. Mm -hmm. 
And my concern is that with the central bank interventions around the world in all sorts of financial markets, that we are creating the possibility for very, very big problems in the future. Yeah, it's been interesting to obviously be in business school during this time and kind mm. of learn real time in the classroom with it. And I was listening to a podcast the other day and they talk about how Jay Powell's role has really changed because of the pandemic, usually very separate from government, but now in a sense having to do, do more hand in hand because yep. of everything that's going on. Yeah. I was asked recently to sort of write a book about rethinking regulation. Mm. And so I approached two people. We've written two books together on regulation. And this is sort of the theme that we're bopping around, which is that it's not just banks. It's non-banks. It's insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And it's many other elements of financial markets that one would never think of having a government backstop. Mm -hmm. And now we see that they do. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that we know in, from economics is that people respond to incentives. And these incentives are pointing very clearly in one direction. And that should not make policymakers very comfortable. Right. Wanted to ask a couple of questions about Ross Levine outside the classroom. What types of hobbies do you do? What do you do in your free time outside of research and teaching? I, I do a lot of hiking and a lot of swimming. Uh, that's kind of the, yeah, that's the main thing. A lot of hiking, a lot of, a lot of swimming. When I can go, we drove out to Wyoming, our daughter's there, and uh, went hiking with her in the Grand Tetons a couple oh, weeks amazing. ago. That was great. My son who works for a startup and is in like virtual space, he's been in a couple places. He's gonna come home for a little bit. That'll be nice. I'm sure he'll wanna play basketball, which is going to kill me. And <laughs> uh, do a little reading, watch some TV. That's oh, about that's it. That's great. And, and what was it like working with your wife filming those videos that we had to watch in class? Oh, it was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've been working together for we met in graduate school, so it's been, it's been a long, wonderful partnership. Yeah, the first time we taught together, actually in the class, was interesting. It was in Brown, and my wife, who worked at the IMF, that is Chilean, there were lots of advantages for her maintaining her diplomatic passport when she was at the IMF. And then when we decided to move to academia, then it became appropriate for her to get to be sit, become a citizen. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we were going to the courthouse for her swearing in, and there's this long line. And that was the day that Lehman Brothers failed. <laughs> so we're online, and I asked her, so, well, are you sure you want to become a citizen of this country? <laughs> there's, still, there's still time to back out. Right. And then, of course, to economists, the major economic event, we start arguing about what this means. <laughs> yes. So... Well, it's about an hour as we wind our way in and take our seats and stuff. So we're arguing, 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 and arguing. And we get there, and there's, there's a nice ceremony. And then I said, you know what? I, I had a big class that afternoon. It was about 200 people. I, I was teaching finance. I says, why don't you come to class, and we'll just have this debate, this argument in class. <laughs> you know, because the students are not going to, look, the world is ending. The students right. are going to want to hear right. about the ending of the world. They're not going to want to hear about whatever I was going to talk mm -hmm. about. So she came to class and we had this debate. And what was great was that she quickly made it personal, which the <laughs> students just loved. And, oh, sure. and, and especially it wouldn't work the other way around because mm -hmm. it, 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 she's a petite person. It's like a, a large male being sort of personally, it, it just wouldn't work. But right. her, her doing it People just loved it. And so then she decided to ask me to come. She was teaching a, a very large class of macro. So I went there and people heard. And so many students from around campus, so it was like 300 students there. So we had a, a, a very, very good time. I think she played it up too much, but no. 
<laughs> but it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. We haven't done a joint class at Haas, but, but working together is just, we enjoy it a lot. That's so fun. One of my favorite podcasts, Planet Money, is doing a series right now they're calling Summer School. Uh -huh. And they feature two economists who are also professors at University of Michigan. And one thing that I love that they always do, and Planet Money's really good at, is they take basic economic principles and apply it to real life. So they've covered sunk costs and dating, food banks, allocations. So I'm curious, my question is, do you have a favorite basic economic um, principle that you use every day or the one that you always fall back to in conversations? I, I, I think the one, uh, the honest answer is no, <laughs> not really. Yeah. If I have to come up with one, this issue of moral hazard comes up a mm -hmm. lot in my business of, of mm -hmm. finance. And it's sort of, it's pretty helpful, but nah. <laughs> 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 All right, fair, fair enough. And you said you were reading. Would you like to share your top three books that you've read recently or that you always find yourself coming back to? Ooh, I read a couple biographies. I read a biography of Winston Churchill and a biography of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And those were kind of interesting for me. Things that I keep coming back to. I read a lot of U.S. history. I, I like that. And part of what's been, it, it's not interesting, but there's almost like this revelation in the U.S. that there's this racist past. And I'm sort of like, where have you people been? Right. You know, it's like, <laughs> what do you think the Europeans did to the Native Americans? And how, mm -hmm. what, what do you think is the few centuries of the behavior of first the, the Europeans and then the U.S. towards... African Americans and Native Americans. There's, there's a book on that that's actually pretty good. This is something called Original Meanings. It's by a guy okay. named Rakov, who's a political scientist at Stanford, and it's about the creation of the Constitution. Mm. I find it interesting because you think of the Constitution as this pure thing. There's no other way it could have been. And it's sort of handed down like some sort of tablet. And you just see all of the compromises and the you know, just-in-time voting of some mm -hmm. person that got it to be in this type of a form, which is what you would expect from a bunch of flawed human beings like we all are coming together and trying to put together some simple rules for a government. And it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a humbling statement that these people did their best. There was a lot of risk and uncertainty and random events, and then they, mm -hmm. they put this together. So to, to treat it too much like Gospels probably reflects more what we need rather than what even what they saw it as. Right. Um, anything else you'd like to share for our listeners or for current or prospective students? I think Haas is a great place to be in, to get an MBA. I think it's a wonderful environment. And I hope to see them, I hope to see you, and have to see them in class. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show this week. My pleasure. Thank you, Paulina. And thanks for listening to this week's episode of Here at Haas. If you loved hearing Professor Ross's story, don't forget to leave us a rating and review. And make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future stories. Until next time, I'm Paulina Lee, and this is Here at Haas.